Next up, we have Betsy Hable. Oh, she's already on the stage. Uh, oh, you've got a prop. I'm so excited. Uh, so Betsy was born in Ohio and lived on a goat farm for the first five years of her life. Uh, she then moved to Washington, D.C., where she is based now. And in the past, she's worked on theater sets um, and doing programming for the last 10 years. So last year, she founded um, a co-op called Cohere, which fo focuses on um, developer education and mentoring and just providing guidance and architectural advice to other developers. So um, Betsy is here today to talk about the challenges of peer programming and the hazards of pairing with people that don't look quite like you. Thank you, Betsy. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Rose mentioned, today we're going to be talking about pair programming with people who are from a different demographic or background than you are. And this is because a lot of existing pairing advice assumes that you're pairing with the same with people who have the same kinds of societal power that you do and the same kinds that you don't. Uh, it starts showing its limitations when folks in the room don't always have the same experiences or kinds of privilege. In those situations, there's a lot of room for unconscious bias to creep in. And there's not a lot of room to give safe feedback about its manifestations. Today, we're going to look at ways to deal with that fact and make better pairing experiences for everyone. Before I get started, I want to issue some disclaimers. First off, this talk assumes that the bad behaviors that happen are accidental. The advice I can give here can help you create temporary safety with an intentionally prejudiced person as well. Or, but it's fundamentally aimed at people who don't realize they're being jerks. If someone doesn't care that they're a jerk, the only permanent solution is to get out or get them removed. Second off, sometimes I'm going to talk about things that underrepresented folks can do to protect themselves in bad situations. This isn't fair. Ideally, folks with privilege should take on the responsibility and emotional labor of fixing these situations. But I know the woman that I was five years ago didn't only need to hear that these situations were unfair. She also needed ways to deal with unfair situations. Last, I'm a white woman. This talk draws from a workshop that I developed in concert with my business partner, Jennifer Tu. Jennifer is Chinese American, and my hope is that her experience and wisdom will deepen the perspective that I'm able to offer in this talk. However, there are obviously experiences I can't speak to directly. So let's get started properly with a story. Back home in DC, there's a programming camp called Ruby D Camp, a little like Rails Camp in Perth. Every year, about 70 developers go into the woods outside DC, and we attempt to survive out where the internet's spotty. So far, it's worked. The opening day is a code retreat. Everyone gets in pairs to work on the same problems. Every 40 minutes, we swap pairs and restart. We do this six times, which is a great opportunity for intentional practice with pair programming. Now, I met one of my favorite people in the Ruby community this way. It did not go great at first. This pair was a dude. It was someone with a lot of experience and a lot of standing in the community. He read me as a lot more junior than I was, and he treated me that way. I guess he wasn't bad with working with junior developers. He was nice about that, but I've been programming since I was eight. And midway through the pairing session, he realized that he'd taken it over and that he'd gone into teacher mode. He got super embarrassed, he quietly stopped, and later on, he apologized. So I took that apology and the spirit was given, and we're great friends now, but... You will also notice that I've been carefully avoiding names in this story, and that is because it's happened twice. Both of the men in the story have talked about it publicly. I feel safe sharing that fact. But yeah, twice. I get to tell a story like this like it's funny, because where both Avdi and Noel were concerned, we were able to chat about it later and laugh it off. It's a lot of the time, it's not that funny. A lot of the time, it does not turn out that well. There have been so many times that I've just been completely exhausted after pairing with a dude. There's been so many times when I've taken a long walk to get away from the office or hidden in the bathroom because I wasn't sure if I was going to cry. I know that I'm not the only woman who's had this experience. And this is as a white woman, a queer white woman, but white. 
It's even worse for women of color, I know. A lot of us think we cannot be that developer. A lot of men look at the diversity numbers in this industry and think, oh gosh, wow, so many other men are sexist. Even knowing what they do about unconscious bias, they don't stop to take a look in the mirror. I'm white. I try not to be a jerk to people who aren't, but God, I am so glad that Jennifer trusts me enough to call me out when I make mistakes. And again, trust me, it is definitely when. And every year at DCAMP, every year, I wind up talking to some junior developer in the women's cabin. I help her process some bad pairing session she went through with a dude. This dude is always some friend or other of mine. It's always someone who I know cares about inclusion deeply. It's always someone I know will be aghast when I tell him he was a jerk. That doesn't change the fact that he was. What we can take from that is that when we're pairing with someone who's from a different background than us, we can't always trust that we're reading the situation properly. In this talk, I'm going to describe bad pairing behaviors and how to recover from them. The first step is learning how to tell you are engaging in them in the first place. Realistically, you probably are. And my assumption, since you're in this room right now, rather than fleeing to get more tea, is that you would like to stop if you are doing so. <laughs> now, there's a lot of bad pairing behaviors that we all know about that are stereotypical. Everyone hates a keyboard hog. Everyone hates the well-actually dude. I don't want to spend that much time on them. There are some other ones we don't think about so, common, so often that intersect really badly with demographic differences. The first is thinking that you're listening, but not actually doing so. A lot of the time, when I'm pairing with dudes and I say something brilliant, they'll echo right back something that is like 80% like what I said. The difference is that it's stupid. This doesn't happen when I'm pairing with women. And the other, like I cited before, is going into teacher mode without getting your pair's active consent. In teacher mode, you're assuming inherently that you know more and that this knowledge gives you the right to take control of a pairing session. These are both really screwed up assumptions when you stop to think about them. It's easy to slip into teaching mode, but it means that you're not pairing anymore because pairing is about collaboration. Pairing is about getting everyone's ideas in the room. There are two big root causes of bad pairing, and both of them are exacerbated if the two people involved have different levels of privilege. It is easy to make assumptions about your pair, and it's easy for unconscious bias to make these assumptions really toxic. Also, if you care more about getting your solution in the code, if you care more about winning, than about maintaining a good, strong pairing relationship and getting everyone's ideas in the room, then you are going to inevitably engage in bad behavior. And this bad behavior is going to be made worse by any demographic differences there are. When my pair's a jerk to me, it doesn't just cost me the time and energy of dealing with them being a jerk. I have to wonder, are they being sexist? Are they being a sexist jerk? It's bad behavior either way, don't get me wrong. But the best way to manage each variation is different. So I need to spend time and energy all of a sudden thinking about that too, instead of just giving them feedback and feeling safe that they'll respond. Speaking of feedback, asking for it is not enough. Asking for feedback is important. But if that's all you're doing, what you're actually doing isn't telling people to give you feedback. It is telling them that your self-image as a person who asks for feedback is quite important to you. I've had a lot of men like that go on to be total jerks to me. <laughs> when that happens, the dissonance between their self-image and their behavior makes it really hard for me to predict how they'll react to negative feedback. Will that threaten their identity as a good dude? Will they lash back out at me? It is hard to tell. It is safer to clam up. So instead of stopping at give me feedback, listen to what your pair is not saying. If your pair is being quiet, or if they seem disoriented, your first assumption may just be that they're disengaged. But I want to think back to your last time you got frustrated at your pair for being disengaged. Did you assume that they were lazy? What else could have been going on? 
It's also easy to misinterpret what people are saying. When we condescend underrepresented folks, we put them in a really bad position. They may wonder if they need to prove themselves as a real engineer. Sometimes this manifests as panic defensiveness or obsessing on fiddly details. This just happens when people feel disempowered. They stop believing that they can communicate effectively about bigger things because you can't, and so, they, and so you need to prove to them that you can tr communicate effectively about something small to build it back up. Your first reaction to your pair being defensive at you is probably going to be that, oh, they're being a jerk. And yeah, defensiveness is not great pairing behavior. But sometimes when people are defensive, it's because you've threatened them, and that isn't great either. Now from the other side, I personally don't always realize when I'm pairing if I'm feeling unsafe. I realize later. I've suppressed how uncomfortable it was because I needed to get through it. This is normal, that's survival, like Heidi was saying earlier. So if you're feeling a little bit off and weird and uncomfortable, in a pairing session, I would like to encourage you to take a moment to listen to that feeling and check in with yourself. Are you tense? How are your shoulders feeling? Are you being a little defensive? What are you responding to, and how do you want to get out of it? So now we know a bit about how to recognize bad dynamics. Before we can then recover from them, we need to reset the situation. In a bad dynamic, pretty much by definition, at least one person is having negative feelings that they need to get away from before you can even begin to recover. Since it can be easy to misinterpret a response to bad pairing behavior, giving someone more direct feedback on that response can often backfire, no matter how empathetically you think you're doing so. Asking for feedback also isn't a cure-all here. Sometimes asking for feedback can be fine, but you don't know what's in your pair's head. It might be an innocuous little irritation, but it might also be something to, that they don't want to admit to because you haven't done enough work to make your pairing and situation safe. It might also be something that they just don't want to talk about and that maybe isn't any of your business. Instead of asking for feedback, Stay, try saying something that actively owns any negative dynamics in the situation. Then, make room for a break to change them. When you ask for a break, for a snack, or for coffee, or for other biological necessities, that's a great way to quickly give you and your pair some space to get in a better headspace. It does so without obligating anyone to share anything that they want to keep private, which is also important. You can also own your own crankiness. When you make your crankiness about you, rather than about your pair or, your, or um, your pairing dynamic, you demonstrate that you're interested in taking responsibility for your own emotions and feelings. That makes it a lot safer and easier for folks to then give you negative feedback later. If you're the less per privileged person in a situation, um, then this is also a perfectly viable plan. Do what feels safest, there's no same in that. But if you want to more directly confront your pair, you can follow a similar two-step process. First, name the behavior. Then, make space for them to have their feelings about it. Try to do that without you in the room. When you're naming the behavior, try to be as specific as possible. When you choose to name specific behaviors, it helps you wa not waste time fighting about intent. Then, make sure you take an explicit break after giving your pair this feedback. Take this break away from your computer. If you're not in the room, then your pair can process any defensive feelings they might be having without asking you to manage them for them. So, we've talked about resetting that, we've talked about recognizing bad situations, and we've talked about resetting back to a neutral point. Next, we need to do active recovery. You can start by apologizing. And this sounds so basic and stupid, and trust me, folks, I wish it actually were.
But next, expose your own uncertainty. Ask your pair for advice. Or do something else that actively demonstrates professional respect for your pair. When you demonstrate active professional respect for your pair, it shows that you not only do you recognize that you did something kind of off, you, act, you actually care about fixing the behavior that you just apologized for. Asking for advice also lets your pair be the expert. It sets you up to learn from them. And that's super great because the thing is, your pair will be able to tell if you're doing this sincerely or just because you're supposed to. When you ask for advice, you force yourself into a position of sincerity. You can't actually fake active listening. You can't actually fake respectful engagement with their technical perspective. So when you respectfully and actively engage with their technical perspective, your pair is going to trust that you do care about their perspective, that you do respect them as a fellow professional. That's the best kind of recovery. This also opens space for your pair to give you real feedback. You're creating an environment of trust in which people can say hard things, including maybe the hard things that you yourself need to hear. So yay, we've recovered from bad staring situations. Except, this is assuming that we recognize in time. What if you don't? What if you don't realize? What if you leave your pair quietly fuming? Or quietly sad? It's okay to realize that these things are happening after the fact. Kind of. It's okay to apologize after the fact. Don't force it. Your pair might not want, might not be in a place where they need to hear it. But you do what you can do. You know, and this lets you prepare for next time. So to sum up. Feedback is great, don't rely on it. When you're observing your pair's behavior, you might observe things that seem negative, but when this happens, go deeper because bad behavior is a cycle. When you try to reset a situation, don't rely on techniques that involve knowing what's going on in your pair's head. Instead, own your own feelings, own the awkwardness of the situation, and make space for active change. Name behaviors, and let people have their feelings away from the situation. Also, you'll both have feelings about it. Don't pretend that away. That's not healthy. If there's space to apologize, make your apologies. If you're unsure about something, own that and use it as an opportunity to make space for collaboration. Regardless, actively listen. Listen some more, listen some more, listen some more. You're going to screw up a lot. And when you've screwed up, it is easy to get into a place where you shame spiral and think, oh God, I'll never be good at this. Oh God, I'm a terrible human. When you do that, you are focusing on your own shame at the expense of being an ally, so stop that. You're going to screw up again, fail better. And this lets us build nice, happy, inclusive teams. Now I did two versions of, the slide, of these slides, and the version that I have up right now is the one that does not include my shameless self-promotion slide, so I'm going to fix that right now. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so earlier on, uh, I mentioned that my first pairing experience with Avdi Grimm, who you may have heard of, he's the Ruby Tapas guy, was not so positive. Um, 
and to emphasize how nice it is when people can recover from these situations and build, happy, and build healthy relationships outside of them, we now work on programming courses together. Courses where we pair program on interesting problems in Ruby and JavaScript and demonstrate how to apply theory to actual code you might write on the job. One of them is out now. It's called Mastering the Object-Oriented Mindset in Ruby. Um, the other is going to be out in probably late May or early June. It's called Untangling Asynchronous JavaScript. You can find out more about these and sign up for free previews on wecohere.com, which is my company's website. Um, I also recently um, collaborated with Jennifer Tu, my business partner, um, and Marlena Compton on zines that draw from, that also draw from the three-hour workshop that this talk was based on. Uh, you can find these at letspair.guide. These adorable pear plushies were a Kickstarter award. Um, there are surplus, and if you email Marlena very nicely, she might start thinking about international shipping. All right, thank you all very much for listening.